Complexity Gaming is a multi-gaming organization from North America. And I've actually had a guest from Complexity on the podcast before. In season two, we chatted to Ashes about what it takes to manage an esports organization. What you might not know is that Complexity Gaming's CSGO team is coached by a South African. His name is TC. And if you're a Counter-Strike fan, you've likely seen him. He stands behind the players. He's on the stream. He's always got that big smile. I've known TC for many years. We, we've we grown up together through esports and we have very close friends. My close friends are his close friends, so it works out quite well. So I could convince him to come on the podcast. And the reason I wanted to convince him is because of that, that connection that we have, I know a lot of TC's story. And I think it's a story that many people don't know and one that I wanted to tell. What's very interesting for me is I remember meeting you in South Africa at Rage, which is obviously like our big gaming expo. And they used to put all the esports tournaments and players in the basement. We used to call it the dungeon. Mm. This was such a long time ago. You were playing with energy. And I remember you were like super young, super friendly, super polite when everyone else was a little bit cocky. Um, and you were kind of the quiet member on the team. You always performed, but you weren't like the big lad sort of bravado player that's a little bit of a dig there because you did play for bravado then but you didn't have all of that 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 sort of swagger you were always just sort of there doing what you needed to do without any of, of the arrogance and it's interesting for me because as time's gone on you've you've continued to be that person so first question tc always smiling why it's a very very good question i don't know i just feel like What's there to be like sad about? I'm a happy person. I'm a happy guy. I've got good things going for me. And um, I just try to bring a good vibe and positivity to like everyone that I meet, uh, everyone that I'm interacting with on a daily basis. I mean, if I can put a smile on someone else's face, why not? And um, like, honestly, like it's it's not forced for me. It's just it's just natural. This is just who I am as a person. And obviously, I mean, you get all the people the saying like, oh, what is this guy doing? He's like, his team's losing, he's smiling, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but I mean, like, that's just, honestly, it's just who I am. Like, you know, I can sit there, I can laugh at the mistakes and 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 see the situation for what it is at the, at the, at the end of the day. And I mean, like, it's, it's not the end of the world. You're going to win games, you're going to lose games. And uh, at the end of the day, we're still going to go back and we're going to go and work on it. So, uh, yeah, if I can bring positivity and, uh, like I said, put a smile on someone's face at the end of the day, then I'm going to do that. I really love that. So I'm going to take us all the way back to the beginning, because obviously growing up in South Africa, a tiny region, completely disconnected from, from the rest of the world when it comes to esports, you decide to get into Counter-Strike. What was it that, that made you decide that this was the game for you? Oh damn! Yeah, that's taking it taking it way back. So I mean, I've always been a a very competitive person. I mean, I did very well at school. Fortunately, that came quite naturally. But I was playing video games probably since I was like five years old. I had a brother who was six years older than me. So at home, I was always playing like PS games against him. Like would usually was always like rugby or soccer or cricket games like that so i was always super competitive and i had to beat him always so like whenever the next game came out i would find like whatever was the best thing to do in that game just so i could be able to beat him and that carried over to school like we was, were always playing uh after school and on weekends at friends houses just playing P ps games against each other like one of my best mates at school actually is uh um springbok lock luet de jager we used to be really good mates like standard three four five six seven around that period and i mean we would always play rugby against each other so that was like a daily thing pretty much and uh yeah i just wanted to always be the best and then one day we go to one of my friend's houses for like a school project and he's like you know you can play against like everyone online right like you can there's like a whole online world where you can play against everyone in south africa and I mean, that obviously just then drew my attention. I was just like, oh shit, well, I didn't know this. Like mom, dad, we need ADSL. I mean, back then we still had dial up at, at our house. I was like, shit, you got ADSL, you know, what is this? So yeah, got ADSL. I mean, we were always playing Counter-Strike at the, uh, like the computer lab or whatever you called it back when we were at school and like breaks and stuff. So uh, got into Counter-Strike also because my mate whose house I was at like was like showing me with Counter-Strike, you know, you can play against anyone in South Africa. And he was showing me some videos of teams uh, competing internationally and playing for money. I, back then it was like Team 3D and those guys. So 
I was just like, wow, like, you know, like, I really want to get into this. I want to, I, I want to be a part of this. I want to, uh, it just brought out that competitive side of me once again. And I just wanted to prove that I'd be able to hang with these guys and play against these guys and playing games for mining. I was like, shit, who wouldn't want to do this? It's interesting though. So you were playing the whole time you were in school, but what uh, a few people might not know about you is that you finish school and you apply to study medicine, get accepted. And off you go to become a doctor, which you now are actually. Uh, but this blows my mind because the whole time this is happening, you are still playing in the top teams in the country. You're still raking on land. You're in the server every night. How did you balance studying menis- medicine and competing in Counter-Strike? Yeah, that was, a, that was an interesting period of my life. Um I mean, yeah, like I was really lucky that, like I said, school came pretty easy for me. So I was fortunate in that regard that I didn't have to spend too much time in the classroom and so on. So um, I was spending more time playing Counter-Strike probably than studying, which is probably not a good thing, but (laughs) the truth is the truth. Um, So, I mean, uh, I think if I was doing any like other if i was studying anything other other than medicine it might have been more difficult to actually do it because like with the way that medicine worked out and the fact that like you could cr- promote your blocks and you didn't have to write exams and stuff that actually gave me a lot of free time so like by the time that rage came around every year you know i would probably be already be done with my year because i didn't have to write any exams so that kind of benefited me in a big way also giving me opportunities like when we had international opportunities to go overseas just having that free time available but yeah that was uh hectic i mean like i would be busy in the mornings usually especially in the later years we would have to be at the hospital like sometimes before six o'clock in the morning uh you'd be in the hospital seeing patients then you would have classes like after that in the afternoon and i mean then when everyone went back home and carried on studying i would be on the server playing dgl matches and (laughs) and and things like that so uh (laughs) I mean, there there was a period where even my parents were like telling me like, why don't you just leave this gaming thing and like focus on your studies? And I was like, but why? You know, like I'm not, I'm not even writing exams. It doesn't make sense. You know, it's not like I'm failing or anything like that. Like, let me just keep on doing this. Um, if it actually interferes with me studying, like, sure, I'll, I'll actually stop. But um, I mean, also growing up in South Africa at the end of the day for us, it's like, we don't really see it, especially back then. You didn't really think it's a viable thing to that you could pursue you know that you could do as a career because uh, in south africa there's just not actually a lot of money in it you know just just gaming there you have to actually break through to the international scene if you want to do it full time so i mean back then i was just literally still pretty much doing it for fun and just for competing with friends i mean like we had the best team um, of friends that i think anyone had especially when we had, we had the energy lineup with goals and and elusive and zero chance and and lighters and you know sonic was a part of that too so like we were just like a really good group of friends and it was just fun always hanging out so it wasn't like this forced thing oh you know we need to practice or whatever it was fun every night getting on playing our games and doing all of that so yeah it was a it was a tricky thing to balance i mean sometimes i would be up until like two two o'clock in the morning just like trying to grind finding new nades dming shooting parts like doing all those things because you still need to try and keep your keep your aim up and find new strategies i was IGLing, of course as well uh for certain periods so uh, you know like you would have to like find new things like even watching other teams demos back then and stuff so um like i said i might have neglected the medicine part a little bit more than i should have but at least i I still managed to promote i still got my degree at the end of the day and uh yeah i'm very happy that i did do what i did because otherwise i wouldn't be sitting here i love that that you're like so in the mornings we see patients but i stay up till three in the morning practicing new nades Inter- <laughs> interesting one uh, lucky for your patients I- i'm sure I- I- you mentioned there about not having to write exams so i obviously do not have a medical degree H- how did that work when you mentioned the thing about the blocks versus writing exams Oh, so basically how it works, I think at most of the universities in South Africa, if you're doing medicine, uh, you basically do it in in certain blocks. And if you get above 60% uh, throughout the entire block, then you would basically skip the exam because you would only need to get 40% for your exam to like get your 50% to pass, right? Because it balances, it balances out. So, um, 
I think obviously if you're getting 60% throughout the entire block because it's on the same work, right? Like you're doing this, it's going to be the same um, work that you're getting asked questions on in the exams and you've got 60% during the block or above it, then obviously you're going to be able to get 40% in the in the exam. So it's just like basically the only time you would want to go and write exam is, exams is if you want to make sure you get your cum louder and you want to go and improve your mark pretty much. So yeah, basically in medicine, um, <laughs> if, you, if you get above 60 percent like i said at most of the universities i know some of the universities in south africa i think like uj doesn't work like that but it ticks if you get above 60 percent you promote and then you don't have to write exams i mean i also think that you're downplaying it a bit because the way you're speaking is like oh if you get above 60 percent, but medicine has this giant dropout rate because people fail and fall out and you were obviously just super chilled with i mean it was clearly working for you you weren't one of those people but what was it about being, I mean, was that the dream? I want to be a doctor. Was that why you chose to go study that that particular field? 100%. Yeah, I couldn't. I mean, I can't imagine myself doing, really doing anything else, like doing a, an office job, you know, situation. So it was always my other passion has always been medicine. And, you know, when I'm done with esports, if I ever completely leave esports, I would, without a doubt, go back to medicine. It still is a passion of mine. but. I didn't want to sit with the what if at the end of the day, you know, like that, that was the biggest thing for me is, um, you know, what if this happened? You know, what if we took the opportunity, we went overseas and things worked out and we could be sitting here competing with the best teams in the world? I, that would be, I think, uh, the biggest regret for me is if I actually just didn't pursue this, just stopped gaming, you know, when I went to varsity or even, I mean, after I finished my degree, you know, like I still, that was, that was pretty much the same thing. Obviously, I moved into a coaching role then so that I could allocate my time better. Um, because obviously I had to do calls and stuff like that, where you working at the hospital the entire evening. So then you, you yeah, I can't be like, oh guys, I gotta leave for two or three hours. I gotta go play a DGL match quickly, you know? It's like, you're the only doctor at the hospital that's responsible for any emergency patients coming in or whatever. So it's like, you can't just not be there. Um, but yeah, it, uh, so I mean, I was obviously in a coaching role that I mean, I, I passed out in my chair a couple of nights, like after getting home, like I would sit in a chair, we'd be practicing or playing a match and I just like fall asleep and wake up like, oh shit, you know, like did, did we win? Like what happened? I'd be the only person on the server there still. So uh, the guys kind of got used to that as well. But um, yeah, I'm very glad, like I said, that I continued to continue along this path and actually kept trying and pushing and when the opportunity eventually came for that bravado moved us overseas that you know that i was still there that i was still a part of the team and that i uh, took the chance i mean i was also very lucky the hospital that i was at uh, gave me like a three month unpaid leave to go and see if it would work out and i mean after we got to america and we i mean pretty much directly as we got there we played that face it like ecs qualifier and we beat teams like dignitas uh, i think we lost the final game against complexity on the third map in overtime you know which so everyone was just like shocked like this team just came from south africa out of nowhere so then it was like for me that was like shit you know like if we actually spend some time in america and we're actually training uh we can actually compete with these guys so for me it was a no-brainer to just go back work my month of um uh, whatever you call it, you know, like just work that last month off my month's notice. There we go. That's the right word for it. And to just head back to America. So that's the thing. When you study medicine in South Africa, you have to do the community service. You're working in the hospital. So right. from what you've said there, that was the move to coaching was simply to free up the time. Uh, but but did you enjoy that role? Because, I mean, I think it must be difficult to because in a way you're almost forced to move. Right. You want to stay in the game, but you realize you can't play anymore. So you move into coaching. Did you enjoy the move or was it more just a necessity of I don't want to be left out of Counter-Strike? Uh, for me, like I would say it was it was a little bit forced, like I would have liked to carry on playing. But uh, like a lot of people, I think in South Africa, especially everyone that moves into the coaching role, like doesn't actually want to coach. Right. Whereas for me, it was a different story. I made that decision. I was like. Uh, you know, like I'm moving into the coaching role and I'm going to make the most of this. Like I'm going to try and actually be the best coach. Like that was also at the time where, um, I mean, the big rivalry in South Africa was usually between energy and bravado. And my decision was like, look, it always felt like I was playing in energy with like the less talented players or like maybe not the super talented players that bravado always had, but we like always had really good strategies and we were always able to compete 
bravado i mean to the point where it was most of the time it would be us in the finals together so i was like well what if like if i take a step back from energy and i just go and coach the bravado team with all these talented players we can stop fighting for scraps in south africa and we can go and compete internationally so that was also my thinking about it um so i mean like like i said like while i would have liked to p carry on playing um it just i feel like it maybe you know it, it wasn't meant to be we were spawned in the wrong location like maybe if we if we born in europe it's a completely different story but unfortunately we were born at the in the in the south of africa so you know you got to you got to work with what you have at the end of the day but uh, like i said for me um i w when i made that switch it was like you know like i'm coaching now i'm not going to and retire or like you know like all these other people do where they like begin coaching and they become a player again when the next opportunity comes along no it was for me it's like cool i'm switching to coaching and i'm going to do whatever i can to help this team win and to help these players grow and to help put us on the map to help put a south african team on the map that was that was the goal and also like i said was just uh in terms of the time that i had to spend at the hospital it just didn't make sense for me to carry on playing because I mean, you would have to do like four, five, six calls a month where you're gone from eight o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock, two o'clock, four o'clock the next day in the afternoon, you know, so like you're not home, you don't have time to like train as much anymore. And then like, obviously, when I get home, I can sit and watch demos, I can sit and watch our practices that we had the night before, and I can still see what, what mistakes we were making, and I can still help the team, whereas like, if I'm not there, it's just a day that you lose of practice. So it's interesting, because I think that this is a global thing, when someone's child is a doctor the you know that's it's a very exciting thing to say look my son the doctor so how did your parents cope when you sat them down and said i know i'm a doctor but now i'm giving that all up and i'm going to go overseas move into a house with five other guys and we're going to play video games all day to see you know if we can make it big especially considering we're from south africa where esports no one has any clue what that is I've, I've seen in the rest of the world you say esports they know but here if you say esports you then have to go into detail trying to explain and and i always find when you get to the competitive gaming point of view people's minds they, they can't wrap their head around the fact that this is an actual thing that's happening so how did your folks cope with all of this well i mean as you can imagine my parents were just overwhelmed with joy when i told them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, I think it's I think it's probably every parent's uh, nightmare. If <laughs> you have a son that just finished med school, he's been working for thirteen months or whatever it is, and he's like, "Well, this has been fun, but I'm gonna go play games overseas now." So uh, I mean, because that's literally, uh, like you said, that's how they see it, right? It's like you, it's like, oh, you play video games. Like they don't understand that there's a whole you know, a whole competitive network, it's, it's like a career, like, especially in South Africa, like you say, in the rest of the world, especially in Europe, when you say esports, people generally know, oh, yes, you know, it's a viable career path. They like, I mean, in a lot of like the Scandinavian countries, they have like programs and schooling for it now even, but um, when you say that in South Africa, it's a completely different story and people don't really react the same way. So yeah, my parents, I mean, at first, when we went uh, overseas, they they thought i was just going for three months <laughs> all right so you didn't tell them the full okay so you should have led with that i did not tell my parents the full story i just left i i was like they they they're not gonna react well to this so let me tell them i'm going for three months which was the truth i was going for three months we we're going to see how it how it goes um so you know it obviously started with that and then when i came back after the three months to work my month's notice at the hospital uh that's when i actually told them but also um i called up one of my professors from the university and like basically explained the situation to to him so fortunately at the university as well they dealt with me a lot because you know we would just go overseas to like eswc or copenhagen games or whatever back then and i'd just be gone for two or three weeks and everyone would just be like who is this kurtzen guy you know like why is he never at the hospital and he's not at class what's going on so uh, i mean <laughs> they knew about me they knew about the gaming situation uh, because i would usually go in and be like hey like look i'm not going to be here for two two weeks or so this is what's happening i'm representing the country and so on so like fortunately i would be be able to to miss out on that so i called him up again and basically explained to him the situation but that i was like a little bit scared of uh you know like what what happens down the line if I, if i want to return you know if, if this doesn't work out like sure you know like we did well now in the first three months that 
that we were overseas, but what if this doesn't actually work out? You know, can I come back? And uh, he basically also put me at ease. And I think what he said, like, also put my parents at ease a lot because it was like, you know, like, look, you always have your degree at the end of the day. Like, there's so many things that you can do with a medical degree. You don't just need to look uh, or stay yourself, you know, data clinical medicine. It doesn't have to be clinical medicine. You can do so many other things with your degree. And I think that also helped put my parents a little bit at ease with the fact that, hey, look, I'm going on this journey, I'm going to try this out, but if it doesn't work out, like I have a pretty solid plan B. And uh, I think that's what a lot of people in esports don't really have. So um, yeah, I think that definitely made them a lot happier with the whole situation. And also now, like it's a completely different situation. I mean, obviously now that we, for the first like two years, it was obviously a bit of a struggle. Um, I mean, we would get some upset wins here and there. We would do well at some tournaments, but it wasn't like a consistent good thing over over the course of an entire year. So, like I would say, especially after um, the ATK stint where we went to Cloud Nine after that, like ever since then, they've been like really on board, super supportive, always watching the games. And like I get messages like before the game, good luck. Messages after the game, like and that's probably like the first people do. As soon as I get my phone, I just see messages from my mom. So yeah, no, they're super supportive and super on board now. And I'm sure even they're glad that I went with the this decision. I've known you for a long time and I, I said this earlier where like I've never seen you I feel like you have a good grasp of your emotions I've obviously seen you very happy I've seen you dejected but for the most part you, you seem in my opinion you're quite balanced you understand how to handle some of the difficult stuff that gets thrown at you which a lot of people don't cope with because obviously like mm. there's a lot of anxiety in competing but now you've uplifted your entire life you've moved to a foreign country and your entire stint from, because you obviously were coaching Bravado Gaming, which was the South African team that was sent over to America for three months. Then I, a couple of months later, there becomes a situation where financially it's no longer viable. The team or the organization is now struggling to keep you in the States. They want to bring you back. There's then a jump to an organization that I think it was like a couple of days, if not weeks, absolute chaos online, all sorts of drama around that typical CS bullshit for want of a better term. Then another South African organization suddenly comes in as the sort of savior, this ATK. They're now throwing money, you're going to stay there. But then suddenly Cloud9's buying you. Then Cloud9, I mean, I can keep going on. Everyone knows the Cloud9. Yeah. Suddenly there's a drop during COVID. Cloud9 has a whole new roster. Now another South Africans come in, set up a, another organization called Extra Salt. There was so much like insecurity, chaos around mm. all of this. How did that affect you mentally? Because you never, ever seemed to be too phased by it. When I spoke to some of the other players, because I'd chat to them once in a while, not online, they, they seemed a little bit distraught about it. You would sometimes see it come out on, on social media as well, and yet you were just constant the whole time was that not messing with your head a little bit i mean for sure it's, it's obviously stressful situations to be in when you're sitting on the other side of the world and you're not sure of you know what your future is exactly where you're going to be in a month's time or i mean even in some of those situations where you're going to be in a week's time so definitely stressful situations but i kind of feel like medicine almost in a way like helped me like be calm for those situations because it, it, it i mean in medicine obviously like you're dealing with a lot of crazy situations where people's lives are literally in your hands i mean you're busy doing c-sections and things like that where it's like literally people can bleed out on the table in front of you so uh i think like that aspect of medicine obviously helped me to be a lot calmer in these situations and also i think like i had I kind of had the responsibility in the team of being being the calm one and being the the person that's logical because I was the oldest uh, in the team. So everyone was kind of looking towards me most of the time, you know, like, what now? What are we doing next? What's the plan? And maybe it also helped that I was the person, like, looking for the next plan. Like, what what are, what are our options? I'm busy. I'm the one that's speaking to to the people. So I think that maybe helped give me a little bit of a sense of calm and like just having that responsibility and so on and that you know i need to put on a, a solid front a solid face in front of the players also because if i'm panicking you know they definitely going to panic so that's not going to help the situation at all um but yeah i think um yeah we've obviously been through been through a lot of of of, of ups and downs and different organizations uh 
but I think we're very fortunate as well with how everything like panned out at the end of the day and the fact that there was always someone that like swooped in to 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 kind of keep to keep us there right at the end of the day so i mean starting with like i mean obviously i mean even starting with bravado it would have been great if we could have kept that bravado team together like just as we started performing and getting so and getting some results but you know unfortunately it didn't work out and maybe it didn't work out for a reason but you know having a uh, warren from atk there too because i was speaking to him pretty much like look the denial situation i knew that was never going to work out we didn't even sign contracts with denial they sent Did over he, contracts and we i knew everyone knew that wasn't gonna, <laughs> the moment it was announced everyone knew everyone knew it wasn't good we were all I, I don't think there was a single person in in cs south africa or otherwise who wasn't look, like guys what are you doing <laughs> Basically, we needed to be able to stay in America, and this guy was going to pay for the house that we were in. So all I needed was someone to speak to the owner of the house that we were in and be like, hey, we're going to pay you so that that didn't have to fall on us. And he did that without us having to sign contracts or anything. He was able to keep us in America until uh, Warren from ATK came in. So, I mean, like, we knew as well that it wasn't going to work out, but we needed to buy time. And we <laughs> we bought time the best way we could. So, I mean, we bought time until Warren came in. I, like I said, I think we were uh, very lucky uh, to have Warren come in at that time. Like, uh, he sorted us out really good. Um, took over everything there and I mean even late in the year when we needed to make changes to to perform like he put up the money to buy out the American players that we wanted and I mean that's pretty much which what gave us the rise like or very quick rise to be able to compete with the top teams in the country back then that moment when we bought out um, floppy OC and uh, MOTM from their contracts and got them from their teams onto ATK I think that's when things just started changing for us and we just started skyrocketing a little bit so and then also of course like it got it like oh, when the whole cloud nine situation happened the fact that uh, dan was there to to come to our rescue again and like literally set up a whole new organization uh, you know started a whole company basically started a whole company the guy, man quit his job like just keep us started a whole new company and kept us kept us in america got our p1 visas renewed and everything so i mean shout out to them really like without them without having these people uh in our lives like we wouldn't have been able to 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 be at the end of the day so yeah full disclosure because i've obviously i'm very i would say very close to your close friends uh, and we've obviously we've known each other for a long time but i obviously know them a little bit better so i know Third hand, if you like, throughout all of these, I think you're very humble because I'm well aware that a lot of those things, like you say you're very lucky and all these people swooped in. But, and I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say this, but I'm going to say it so you can tell me to take it out if I need to. But I know that the truth is that you were the one facilitating a lot of this. You were the one looking at these avenues. You, a lot of the time, were, were the one reaching out to different people saying, Maybe this is a, a way to, you know, save save our skin, keep us in this house. This is someone who could potentially benefit from a relationship with us. You know, Dan, this is the the proposal that, that I have, that, that this is something we could do. I mean, I don't think that was exactly how that conversation went. But I don't think you take enough credit because as much as you're the coach of the team, you were doing a lot of like management and keeping the whole thing alive which is fascinating to me because you're the coach and, and the players have the power to remove you at any time. And yet you were doing this all for them. Is that just in your nature? You're just a problem solver. You're a doctor. You need to save everyone. Is that what, what ended up happening there? I think, I mean, like in a way, right. I, I was definitely the one, the one reaching out and making contact. I mean, with the whole Dan situation, I think that happened, just happened at the right time. Dan was actually interested in getting into esports. I mean, we were playing a lot of like Valorant and just face it back in the day, like while we were on cloud nine in the evenings and so on. So when that opportunity came along, um, I mean, yeah, it was like Dan and I was sitting and going through the numbers, you know, does this make sense? Like how are esports organizations making money? Does it make sense for for us to try and start like this whole new organization? So yes, I mean, I was very much involved in, in all of those conversations and making these things happen and, uh, you know, trying to, trying to push forward, but it's also, at the end of the day, like you said, like I was also, I wasn't just the coach of the team. I, I was also managing and doing and doing all of that. 
So I felt like it was kind of my responsibility to make sure that we that we landed on our feet. And I mean, it was also in my best interest, right, to make sure that we keep this alive and that we can keep going because, uh, you know, like we're, we're, you don't want your story to end there at the end of the day. It's like, hey, we went overseas, we competed in some big tournaments, made some upsets, won some money, and, you know, now I'm back in South Africa. No, hell no. I definitely didn't want the story to end there. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, I will always do what I need to do. I feel like, you know, like if I, if if I need to go be the person sitting in the meetings doing the proposals, I'll I'll do that. You know, like I'll find time to do that. And I think, yeah, like you said, I mean, as for as for the players, um, like I'm just a super caring person in general. So I mean, if you're having a problem, I'm I'm going to help. Like it doesn't mean just because I'm the coach, I just coach like in the team. Like at the end of the day, you also a lot of the esports players are people who pretty much came directly out of school have very little life experience and you know they're just thrown into the deep end you're in esports and you're out here on your own and you know you have no like skills or life experience to handle a lot of the situations that that you that you that you dealt or that and that you need to face so i mean from my side like i always try to help i try to educate a little bit try to give my perspective on these things and yeah try to help people grow and uh, maybe help make them better people at the end of the day or more competent people at the end of the day so i mean i think that's why our teams always also tend to to stick together in a way because it's it's not just like this work environment where we're just colleagues it feels like uh, most of the time it feels a lot more like a family and you know we're we're all close friends and at the end of the day i mean we literally still have whatsapp groups with all of our previous teams pretty much so it's like we're, we're our old cloud nine team still has the whatsapp group where we talk to each other you know our extra soul team still has the whatsapp group and you, you know you, you can carry on like that so it's always like we're always sending messages on those groups so it's like even some people are in different games now like the uh, james rl and mix the coaches we are on cloud nine you, you, you know they're still with cloud nine valorant motm who was playing with us back then is now playing for atk so i mean we're always sending messages in in these groups of saying good luck to each other for our games and stuff because at the end of the day you know it's like we're, we're not just colleagues i mean you spend so much time together it's uh it would be silly to 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 think that you know like you just were colleagues at the end of the day you know like you spend literally 12 hours of a day together maybe even more sometimes I mean, for me and johnny i mean we <laughs> we spend like sometimes 16 hours of the day together it's like literally all day every day so i mean it's just uh we're all really good friends we all care about each other at the end of the day and yeah i think that's uh pretty much i think hopefully that answers your question about why the guys didn't try and get rid of me as a coach when i was doing <laughs> managing or anything like that i mean i was even the chef at a point in in atk trying to make sure we're eating healthy i'd get I've the guys into, oh yes i've heard I'd about this story about get you the trying guys to stop into that. the scrum i've got the guys in the scrum and then i go and cook food then i just pop in every now and then or we'd be playing esea like uh, back then it was still mdl so then i just pop in every now and then i was like, oh, okay we're leading seven zero is fine i carry on making food sometimes you get back then it's oh shit it's zero seven like what's going on let me sit down for a little bit but yeah that actually i was so scared when this whole coaching spectator bug came out or was just announced because i was like shit you know like i joined all these games on esea and i was in the kitchen like cooking like i don't know if i was in a spectator bug or something like and i'm like well, how am i gonna prove that i wasn't even sitting there so thank god it never happened to me <laughs> Because, like I said, I wouldn't have even known. They just have, like, oh, we have all these cases. But you did it so, you. yeah, all these cases again. And, and you were like, I was I was frying eggs. And was no like, one's going to believe you. Exactly. So when that got announced, I was like, oh, shit. Like, you know, like, literally, I could have cases. I wouldn't even know. Oh, no. But, yeah, those were good times. Like I said, I mean, like, at the end of the day, you just got to do what you got to do to to push through and to get us to the next level. And that was my thinking. Like, it doesn't matter if I need to cook, if I need to clean, if I need to manage, if I need to coach. Like, I'm going to do all of that. Just I'm going to do whatever I need to do to to make sure that we perform and to get us to the next level. I love that kitchen story because my understanding was that ended up happening. You started cooking for everyone because if you didn't, they would just eat takeout or not eat or mm. just snack. So you decided you would cook to make sure everyone had healthy, balanced meals. Uh, and I think that that's my favorite part about you, though. Like, that is just your personality. You want to take care of people. You want to bring out the best in them. 
I'm curious though, because the truth is we we both we've we've worked in in some we've worked in esports in developing regions. We've both been on the international scene and we can't sugarcoat the fact that I mean I love my job. I know you love your job, but esports sometimes a lot of the time not not a pretty space. There's like there there is a lot of there's a lot of tough stuff that, that you have to deal with. And it does turn a lot of people really bitter. And you have gone through the ringer. And yet, look at you, you're still smiling even now. How how have you not let some of that get to you? How how has it not infected your personality just a little bit? Honestly, like I mean, I, I, I honestly can't tell you, Sam. That's a, like a really good question. I mean, like, I, I suppose, like you said, uh, if if you put different people in my shoes and they face with these different situations, like, yeah, very well, you could probably, uh, they'd probably end up bitter and so on. But I mean, I consider myself so fortunate and lucky to uh, just have, you know, lived the life I've lived. I mean, like, Growing up from coming from Springs, you know, like a little town on the East Rand to like being here now, like living in the US, uh, like representing complexity and like all these, all these big teams, like it's something, I mean, something I never thought would happen when back in 2014, we were playing a LAN where third place got Steel Series towels. I remember when we rocked up that LAN, LAN, a decent Bravado and everyone's like. That is still a thing in South Africa, but yes. (laughs) And everyone was like, oh, energy's going to win towels. And we were just like, no, 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 we're definitely not winning those towels. We're getting first place, yeah. Uh, but I mean, like, yeah, I think I just, it's just, it, it's all a matter of perspective at the end of the day, right? Like, I mean, you can, uh, two people can look at uh, the same situation and, you know, one can uh, one can think it's a really shitty situation and the other one can be like, all right, cool. Well, what can we take away from this? What can we learn from this? And you know, what life lessons can we can we take out of this and let's be better for the next one. And I think like, that's just what I always try to do. I just always try to try to see like, cool, if something bad happens, like what what can we learn from this? And like, let's move on, let's be better. So there's no point holding a grudge living in the past. Like that doesn't get you anywhere at the end of the day. And uh, yeah, I think that's probably why one of the reasons why, you know, why I'm still here, why I'm still pushing regardless of, of everything that that's happened. I mean, like, just like even the whole, like let's say the cloud nine situation was like okay cool so for my next contract i want to make sure this this and this is is in the contract so that you know the the situation like this doesn't happen again so you know you basically learn from it and you move on and that's it at the end of the day no hard feelings you're so wholesome i just can't believe esports hasn't broken you (laughs) you're just so wholesome but i it's it's an interesting one because you you said earlier about how you didn't want your store or our story to end there where you were talking about all the team shuffles and stuff. So where does in your mind where does the story end for for TC or where does the story go? Um, so to be honest, um, I kind of. Uh, and, you know, I like I I turned thirty in in August now on the on the twenty third. So. Uh, yeah, it gave me obviously during the player break and so on. Like I was kind of thinking about everything that we've done so far, and like just coming into this next season and what we wanted to do and what we want to try and accomplish and what I want to try and accomplish as a coach before I leave the space. I mean, I think I'm still pretty fortunate in in the sense that like most of the coaches in the scene um, are are actually pretty pretty much like all older than me you, know, you get a young coach here and there but most of them like the average age is like 35 so i feel like i still have a good amount of time left um but yeah i came into this season like really wanting to push and i just like kind of decided like i i, I, I don't want to just hang around the top tier anymore like i i want us to to win some tournaments you know we want to make playoff runs we i want to lift the trophy like you know i want to lift the trophy on stage and once you lift one trophy like i said i'm a very competitive person so uh, i i'm not going to want to stop there so i mean for me this next part of my career is like all about just pushing and doing whatever i need to do i feel like at the end of the day to try and uh, get the team to perform to the best of their ability so that's pretty much what i what i want to do is like what my goals are for the next few years is like 
try and see how hard we can push, try and see how good of a team we can become. I mean, you never know at the end of the day if it's going to still going to be the same team, if I'm still going to be on complexity or whatever is going to happen in that sense. But um, that for me is like a big goal for these next two years to just push, try and win some tournaments. And honestly, like after th after that, I don't think I would leave esports. Like I would think I would want to still like move I'm just move into like the into the management department, you know, like if I if I'm getting older, like uh I fortunately have some experience in that department for <laughs> a lot of experience, yes. <laughs> Lots of experience. Uh, I mean, so um so yeah, I mean, I don't know if it would be like just as a general manager or what that is at the end of the day, but um yeah, we definitely want to remain in esports and uh, you know, on the business side of things, I've always liked like the business side of things so i think that's what would probably be my next move afterwards it was nice when extra salt started and we were sitting in on the on the meetings we were presenting and trying to raise some some some, some money so you know i would uh i think that would definitely be the next move but uh i think that's still very very far away for me like i want to i want to try and remain on the competitive side of things for as long as possible hopefully counter-strike remains uh, you know, it's still around for 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 a long time, so that so that uh, you can actually make that happen. But uh, yeah, that's for me. Is I just want to push. I just want to push as hard as we can. We started now off yet Pro League. I mean, we already at Blast things were going a little bit better already. But obviously, we didn't really make the the best run there. But we were at least able to beat Navi and uh, play close games against Liquid. Uh, but at least yeah, Pro League, we actually showed what we can do. Like we've been working really hard. We've like I've changed some some of the things in our practices we've changed ways uh, a couple of things in the way we're preparing for opponents and things like that so yeah like i said hopefully it keeps working but if it doesn't wor work like i'm going to find a different approach and we're going to try something else because like you said I'm, I'm a problem solver so yeah it's all about just pushing for now when you you take a look back because i know for me and i think this is more relevant i ask everyone this question but i feel like it's more relevant for us because of where we were based and how far away we were from from everything but who was your favorite sort of top pro counter-strike player to meet because there was that one person that you met at some point and just went damn i can't believe i'm i'm in a room with this person or i'm, I'm meeting this person who was that for you um sure let me think like probably it has to go back to like i would say eswc 2014 because you know back then just the fact that we were there like playing with all the teams that i'm always watching online like trying to learn from trying to steal things from from them so i mean back then it would definitely have been I, I can't like really just name one specific one if i had to like forest obviously like just the goat like so that was obviously sick to meet like him and get right the nip team back then um and then uh olaf as well like we met him as well in 2013 of 2014 at, at ESWC. um i'm sure ash has told you the story uh, there i don't know if he has but you can always ask him for it <laughs> we'll, we'll find out the story and i'll i'll release it on, i'll get i'll get <laughs> Give it to, to Reddit so that they can release the story because I'm sure it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I feel like um, you should I mean, tell it... us the story. Now we're here. We've got you. And anyone listening doesn't know who Ash is. Ash is, a, is someone called Goals. He owns Goliath Gaming, a South African gaming organization. He played competitively. He's one of TC's very close friends, one of my close friends. So I feel like now you've led us down this path, you will have to tell us the story. I'm, 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 I, I, I literally can't. <laughs> I cannot believe that you've now hinted to it. Can we not get like the, the safe for work version? Um, no. <laughs> this is one of those. We're just going to leave it hanging. This is one of those. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, <laughs> actually, I mean, yeah, no, I no. Can't. let's just leave it. That story's Might done. Have... We'll leave it at that. TZ well, tells you all this information. If you'd like to know more, you can go find goals on Twitter. I'm sure he'll share it with you. Exactly. Exactly. Maybe. <laughs> And what happens in what happens in Paris stays in Paris. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> and you've just jogged my memory, and I actually do think I know the Paris mm. story. Oh, I do know the Paris story. <laughs> that cannot be said on the podcast. All right. So exactly. final question, because now we've gone completely <laughs> off track. Final final question. Why do you love Counter Strike? Oh, whew, you're throwing me in the deep end, yeah. <laughs> Uh, for me specifically, I think um, yeah, Counter Strike is just special, right? In the sense that 
it's very very easy to appreciate for for anyone watching it right like it, it's it's easy to understand uh from the perspective of like it's like five people fighting five other people you know you have your attacking team you've got your defending team these guys need to plant the bomb these guys need to stop them from planting the bomb so it's so easy to just understand from a watching perspective but it's all the little details that just make it special like understanding the economy understanding the utility like you can just see when teams are are, com are communicating so well that like all these little pinpoint things are just going perfectly. And I think for me specifically, like that is just what makes it special. So, I mean, like, like I said earlier, like I just love co competition. I'm a very competitive person. And, you know, when, when all these like little small things are just going perfectly, like that's, that's the part that I love about it. But also the fact that you can have like this perfect team play and then one guy can just have a crazy game and just run in there and put his team on his shoulders and just like the bulldoze through your squad. Doesn't matter if you have the perfect crossfire setup, doesn't matter if you have the perfect utility usage, you know, like it just doesn't matter. So sometimes all of that just goes out the window. So, I mean, that's, I feel like, why why i love counter strike you know it's like all the all the small details all the little things that go into it but the fact that you know like you can literally get carried 1v5 still at the end of the day whereas like it's completely different to uh to other games like dota i feel like you know like we you can't really 100 100 percent do that but in counter strike that that's possible you know you can just have someone running in there bulldozing through your entire squad and sometimes you just got to be like hey and that happened, let's go next. You know, you can't get caught up on that round or be upset about it. It's just kind of like, shit, like, man's having a good game. Like, you probably can't believe he hit those shots. So you just got to move on from it. You're listening to Take All Talks Season 3, where we're telling the stories of some of the names and faces and voices that you get to enjoy while watching Counter-Strike. If you enjoyed this podcast, please, will you give it a little like or subscribe on the platform of your choice. And of course, as per usual, if you have any feedback, make sure you send it to me on social media at TechGirlZA. I will include all TC's information in the description to this podcast. So if you want to find out a little bit more about him or follow him online, go check it out.